This is Stephanie Ooze at NASA Goddard. And I am delighted to introduce today, we have Dr. Nathan Torbeck. He's a director at Applied Geosolutions, where he's worked for the past decade since he completed his PhD at Michigan State University. Um, he specializes in developing and growing decision support tools and measurement, reporting, and verification platforms for diverse end user groups across commercial industry, government, and academic sectors. He'll be telling us more about that today in his presentation. He's currently a co-I on NASA Harvest co uh, initiative, co-leading the domestic strategy and SAR optical data fusion for addressing information gaps. So we're gonna hear more about him, uh, you know, about his projects as well as his ideas for growing public-private partnerships to scale de decision support tools. Um, thank you all for coming. He's going to come up and talk at the end when we have questions. Um, we'll bring around microphones to make sure that people on the line can hear your questions as well. So welcome, Nate. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Um, thanks, Sean and Stephanie, for the invite way back when, maybe six months ago, four months ago. We had some holidays and transitions, but I'm here now. A little bit of a general title, but I'm going to talk about scaling agricultural DSTs with moderate resolution EO. And many, many, many people have contributed to a lot of this work. I'm not going to go through and read all the names. I have a little bit of a list at the end. And um, I know there's a mix of backgrounds and interests and skill sets in the room, so I'll try to kind of meander through uh, a couple topics and then bring it all together at the end. Um, but I'll also be sticking around, so if you have questions, comments, thoughts, my goal really is to generate some dialogue, generate some ideas, see what kind of partnerships and synergies I might be able to generate, so please let me know. So just a quick little overview of where I come from, where I work. It's cool to have a small business here. I assume you guys have a lot of government agency speakers, a lot of academic university professors, so thanks for having a small business here. Um, I work at Applied Geo Solutions. We're about an hour north of Boston in uh, home of UNH, the Granite State, in, in Durham, New Hampshire. And essentially, we're a team of data scientists, remote sensors, modelers. Um, we, our goal, our vision, our kind of our mission is to help take applications to scale. That's what we're good at. We're good at kind of taking ideas in the geospatial modeling world and growing those. Um, a lot of the reason why I'm here is because I'm on the Harvest program, as that was mentioned, and I help lead some of the domestic strategies, some of the radar optical integration. So I'm going to kind of comb through some of those projects, applications today. Kind of just to give a little bit more background, we kind of have three main groups of tools. We essentially use satellite data. Um, uh, uh, we tend to focus on open source, operational, moderate resolution EO data. We try to build cost-effective MRV tools, so that really has to focus on operational open access data. So thanks to NASA and everybody, ESA, for making a lot of these systems open access. Process-based modeling, really crop modeling, and then what I just call big data software. It's kind of uh, begin to take over, a little bit of a buzzword, but the idea to how do you handle all that data in kind of an integrated uniform system. We've pushed a, a, a good portion of a lot of these themes to get um, we keep some of it behind the curtain, but let me know if you're interested. Okay, so here's my main three goals, my main three messages. I kind of call these hypotheses. Number one, open access operational synthetic aperture radar SAR and optical EO is really the key to scaling the next generation of ag decision support tools. My argument is that field scale is really the area of unit where you're going to make a decision. Do I fertilize? Do I irrigate? Do I have pests? And really that's the management scale. Another word is that's the livelihood scale. That's where you're either going to make money, lose money. That's the scale where things happen. Sensors like SMAP and SMOS are great. They're awesome. But at 36 kilometer or even nine kilometer, it's hard to have a farmer that's managing a 40 acre parcel use that information to make a decision. So how do we get the moderate resolution to kind of bring those down to field scale, which is the decision making scale? Um, MRV platforms, um, I believe are the key to growing what I call the conservation ag economy. I think precision ag has turned also a little bit into a buzzword. 
um, by sales forces and sales teams. Um, and I'd say that space is crowded, but the conservation ag space, I'd say, has a lot of gaps, a lot of needs. So I try to serve as kind of a bridge between research centers, government agencies, and kind of industry. And a lot of what I do is try to promote these public-private partnerships. Number three, and maybe this is a little bit of stretch, we can go get a beer tonight and argue and debate, but I truly feel that EO data for the next few decades is really going to be the key towards achieving or beginning to get towards these sustainable development goals and these kind of what we call grand challenges, things like poverty, hunger, climate change. I truly believe that moderate resolution EO is going to be the linchpin, the, the link in the chain that ties that all together. So those are kind of the three take home messages, three hypotheses that I wanted to, to kind of introduce as I go through my talk today. And just want to say thanks to multiple funding opportunities. Again, NASA Harvest, the main reason why I'm here. I do a lot as a small business with SBIR. That's the Small Business Innovative Research. It's kind of a multi-phase program. Essentially, you have an idea. You want to do a feasibility. You apply for a phase one. They're usually about six months, 150K. There's about a maybe 10%, 15% success rate. There's probably some people in here that oversee some of those SBIRs. And then if that's successful, you move to a phase two. Those are two years, maybe 750K, a million dollars. That's where you build that prototype. In theory, at the end of that two-year project, you're ready to go to market. You're ready to scale. Um, there's 11 federal agencies that have an R&D budget over 100 million. They all have SBIR programs. NASA is one of those. Um, a lot of what I do is try to leverage public-private partnerships between industry, NASA centers, including Goddard, using SBIR. So those are kind of monies that are out there. How can we use those to support your programs? And I would encourage everybody to kind of think about that, to look into that if you're not familiar with it. Try to find a private sector partner to help take some of your research to scale. And lastly, I'll give maybe one or two quick uh, slides from a, an IDS Mekong project. That's an interdisciplinary science project. But really, these four themes are all kind of have the same science, the same algorithms, the same technologies that I'm trying to use. Can I scale agricultural decision support tools using that moderate resolution EO data? OK, <clears throat> so here's the kind of a cartoon that I tried to make to try to explain or visualize what it is I'm trying to do. Ultimately, we have farmers out there. They have to make all these different kinds of decisions. Things like irrigation and soil moisture. Do I need to water my crops? Things like tillage practice cover crops. Things like crop rotations. They have all these different decisions to make. Each one of these takes time, costs money, etc. Can we use satellite data, EO technologies, along with other tools, such as big data software, process-based models, etc., to help improve these managements? Can we make cost-effective tools to reduce their burden so they can essentially optimize these decisions for either more money, less expenses, better soil health, et cetera? What I try to work on is coming up with these metrics using EO data so I could drive ecosystem service markets and supply change, which then the logic, the theory is, um, we come up with better ways to return value to that farmer, to that producer. Um, there's obviously a lot of moving parts here, but can we begin to reward producers either through subsidies or premiums on products to practice best management practices with some of these kinds of categories? Obviously, I can't get into every one of these categories today, so I'll just touch a little bit on irrigation and soil moisture, which is where some of my current work that's funded through some of the Goddard programs uh, in, in this talk. So I'll mainly talk about RICE MRV, RICE Measurement Reporting and Verification System, just to give a little bit of context. Um, we had about a decade of projects through LC Luck and USDA to help monitor agriculture. These tend to focus on kind of food security issues, where and when is the rice, what's the health of a particular crop. Of course, rice is tied to about three, three billion people, either through livelihoods or diet, so it's one of the, the major staples in the world. We had a variety of papers and research, and we kind of said, okay, it seems like there's a lot here. We want to see these tools used in the real world, so that's why we went in and tried to take those projects and really make programs. Can we come up with these decision support tools? So went in for a NASA SBR in 2012 and kind of to build this rice decision support tool to support commodity markets and food security programs. That's kind of grown. We're now using this for ag results and some of those other programs that we listed. 
and Harvest, the Goddard-run food security initiative, is kind of a, a partner in driving some of this forward. So what does Rice MRV do? Um, it does a few things. Essentially, for any patty in the world, we want to tell you when and where is the rice. Those are metrics like extent, calendar, intensity. And I kind of call these the food security themes. Um, programs such as GeoGlam and Crop Monitor, they're charged with having transparent, robust, timely information on agricultural production. In places like Southeast Asia, rice really is the livelihood. Um, the kind of the second tier would be health and how much, things like condition, yield, and forecasting, and this has become a bit of a popular space. There's a lot of kind of private companies, Silicon Valley shops, labs, that are all trying to kind of forecast yield before USDA as tight as they can, et cetera. The third really, which is what my interest is and which what I'll talk about is getting at the practices and outcomes. How can we come up with these operational sustainability metrics? Um, about 10 years ago, Erie, which I would call kind of the global uh, knowledge body on rice system, came up with this, the sustainable rice platform. About three years ago, we had a SIG grant with Winrock and the American Carbon Registry to make a US-based version of the sustainable rice platform. So I've been using NASA opportunities, NASA sensors, as well as ESA and JAXA to kind of come up with methods, automated operational field scale methods to support the SRP. And I'll talk mostly about the US version. So things like water balance, greenhouse gas, soil moisture. And we've got a lot of partners, including USA Rice, Mars, um, you might know them better as Snickers. Um, all these big, they're really agricultural commodity companies. Okay, so here's kind of a conceptual schematic of what the Rice MRV platform looks like, and this is always evolving and always growing and changing as sensors come and go, but it's essentially Earth observation tools, it's models, and most important, I always like to emphasize, it's really people. Um, it's the end users, it's the growers, it's the co-ops. So there's all these different satellite sensors and platforms and different levels of uh, versioning out there. Things like SMAP and SMAS soil moisture, um, Sentinel-1, Sentinel or Pulsar-2, I've been using to look at inundation, um, HLS, which I would call uh, kind of a, a Goddard product or being spearheaded here to harmonize Landsat and Sentinel-2, et cetera. How do we take all those different satellites that all provide one or two or three particular type of metrics and put them, put them funnel them into this MRV platform? We can use those platforms to make direct measurements of the sustainable rice platform key performance indicators, or we tend to use that to drive our process-based modeling. And here we're using kind of what I call hybrid version of DNDC and ORISA. So this essentially does greenhouse gas accounting, water balance, and yield. To drive those modeling platforms, you basically need three broad types of information. You need soils, weather, and management. Um, soils in some places is good. In the U.S., Sergo, I'd say, is pretty good. In other places, East Africa, Vietnam, it's not so hot. There's data sets like the Harmonized World Soil Database. There's other data sets coming online that are better. But it's not all going to be solved by EO data. We need a lot of other types of information, too. And, of course, management. Some managements you can remotely sense for, others you cannot remotely sense for. So field surveys, social scientists, extension officers, kind of the people are also very important in the system. And the idea is with this framework, we look at these KPIs, things like yield, GHG, nutrient use efficiency, water quality, water quantity, profitability. I know a lot of physical scientists tend to get uncomfortable if they talk about economics of a lot of this, but if you're talking to producers and farmers and uptake, you have to talk about um, how much things cost and how much money you might save, etc. There are other KPIs, of course, that we support philosophically, but our tools don't necessarily monitor or assess things like child labor, women's empowerment. Of course, we promote those, but Rice MRV does not monitor those. So the main tool of choice for me is really radar, synthetic aperture radar, SAR. I think the first kind of go-to uh, why should you use the sensor tends to be it's, you know, can penetrate clouds, all weather operation. 
um, which is definitely good. There's been historical barriers to entry to using SAR. Mostly it hasn't been operational and open access. It's always kind of been mission tasking. Um, now with ESA's Sentinel platform, with NISAR planned for launch, with PELSAR 2, PELSAR 4, with the radar set continuity mission, the radar's coming, SAR is coming. So I would begin to adapt, begin to use it. Really, to me, the, the more appealing reason to use SAR, other than the cloud penetration, is really what it's sensitive to. I think most pr people are familiar with Landsat, with MODIS, um, with Sentinel-2, kind of the optical sensors that see things like FPAR, like LAI, chlorophyll, the vegetation canopy. SAR, you can kind of look at these other structural features, so like the number and density of objects, the orientation of objects, um, essentially the, the dielectric contrast or the, the soil moisture. Those are the items, depending on the particular wavelength and the polarization that radar is sensitive to. So to me, combining the radar with the optical data, you get a much more complete, thorough picture of your target, of those scattering mechanisms. Um, the baseline observation scenario are the boss for Sentinel-1, Sentinel-1A, Sentinel-1, one B varies by region. I think most people are familiar with Landsat where you're getting an image every 16 days, every eight days if you intermix them. It works a little bit differently with these sensors because it's very intense to collect radar data. Um, in places like uh, the Mekong, you can get an image if you include ascending and descending every three or so days. In other places like the Midwest USA, you're looking about every 12 days, give or take, using one sensor. We've made some pretty slick software, if I can say so myself. You know, we, I've tried using some commercial software for a few years, and I'm not here to promote any software over another, but at the end of the day, they were always kind of closed ecosystems. We couldn't kind of integrate them into our big modeling framework, so we went back to square one. We kind of built it ourselves from the ground up, and Zhao Dong has really spearheaded a lot of this work. Um, essentially, you could suck in any radar sensor that you want and essentially do any kind of processing. Um, I'm not going to go through all this. We've pushed a lot of this to Git. If you kind of Google or look for us on Git, you can find a lot of this. If there's a particular module you don't see, just let me know. But everything from kind of big data CONUS scale maps of DB and, and gamma to subsidence, um, this platform can do it all. And uh, it's pretty slick, pretty efficient, pretty robust, paralyzed, et cetera. Okay, so let me jump into some of the examples. Arkansas, here's some current R&D. It's pretty cool, it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm from New Hampshire. It probably took me four or five years to get all these folks comfortable with me coming down there talking about climate change and, and water and why I, they should let me walk around on their fields. Um, but most of these folks are really environmental stewards. They care about their land, they care about production. A lot of them are fifth, sixth, seventh generation farmers. So this is a snapshot of Arkansas. A lot of people don't know it, but we happen to grow a lot of rice in Arkansas. And I think we're actually the top five exporting country because this rice is very high quality. A lot of it gets used for sushi, so a lot of it actually leaves the country. I've got about 12 different production families that I'm working with, and just a couple of the, 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 the usual suspects. There's Dan Hooks. This is a typical groundwater well pump, so doing things like looking at irrigation infrastructure. This is Dennis, I call him the carbon cowboy. He's out here helping take some measurements for soil moisture, it looks like in a soy field. Most farmers, I also like to say, don't grow just rice. You're gonna do rotation. So most rice farmers also grow soy, some corn. Cotton is a little bit of a different beast because it requires different infrastructure, but typically they have a, a, a rotation of those major crops. And then over here is Mike Sullivan, where we work on tracking what I call identity preservation, or IP. Uh, Michelle Reba down at ARS in Jonesboro. And that's Josh Hankins from USA Rice. So my, my take home message there, a lot of different partners, farmers, government agencies, lobby groups, we're all trying to work together to kind of figure out some of these issues. How do we conserve water, optimize growth, reduce carbon footprints? We've kind of got this experiment going on and we're working on scaling it. And EO data is really the key to kind of growing that over the whole region. We do some pretty cool instrumentation. I don't know if this is going to work. It's a video. Um, so kind of two videos on the top. One is just kind of a 
flew some drones. This is a contour levee system. You can see the levees essentially follow the landscape of the land. This is with the G DJI matrix that I was using to do some CalVal. We also do some cool low-tech sensor collection. This is basically a toilet bowl bobber on a pole. As the water moves up and down, the pole kind of moves up and down, and there's a pheno cam that kind of captures the water table level, or a farmer can go out every day and take a text, take a text and, and send it to the system, because we have to be able to track who's doing what practices. And a handful of fields, we have paired control treatments where we're doing kind of the full suite of what I call high-end science measurements, some, some EC towers, and then also different soil moisture measurements in the field. We're trying to measure soil moisture, we're trying to measure water table depth. Those are kind of some of the main parameters we're collecting with this data. A quick cartoon of one of the main metrics, the kind of one that's really going to move the needle. Um, you might have heard me mention this before, but it's AWD, alternative wetting and drying. And here's kind of a cartoon. There's multiple ways you can manage rice. Rice requires intense water for cultivation. Essentially, you have traditional flooding, where you flood up the field, you keep it flooded throughout the season. And we're also trying these other practices, such as alternative wetting and drying or multiple inlet rice irrigation, essentially where you let the paddy dry down. That reduces methanogenesis, reduces your anaerobic activity, so lowers your methane footprint, lowers your carbon. There are some other trade-offs, such as potentially increasing nitrous oxides. We're trying to kind of weigh those balances. And you can see kind of some of the outcomes. We don't necessarily need to increase crop yield, but we certainly can't decrease crop yield. Um, it does improve soil aeration. In Arkansas, we found that practicing AWD reduces total water use and GHG emissions by about 30%, give or take. And there's some other benefits that we're discovering, such as reducing arsenic, which is a big deal for um, rice mulling. Just to give folks another glimpse of kind of the irrigation practices, there's all these different managements that we can do. So how do we choose? How do we know? Um, these are acre inches of water. You have things like contour levees, which require up to 44 inches for a season, straight levee, side inlet levee, and straight levees combined. And you could see here AWD. So AWD, especially where you have precision grade, where you have these lasers go out and level the field, or zero grade, use about essentially half the water as a contour levee traditional rice field. So that's a big difference. That moves the needle. This is a place where the groundwater table is rapidly depleting. New on-field farm reservoirs cost in the neighborhood of 200, 250K. Typically, you could get NRCS to match half of that, but that's expensive, and you're taking 40 acres out of production. So kind of on-field water management is a big deal. And typically, depends where you are, but you get a lot of spatial variability in rain from the summertime thunderstorms, but anywhere from you know several inches to maybe in the teens if you're lucky. And of course, I mentioned um, yield and finances. You have to make the economics of everything work. These are from some trial plots shared by uh, uh, Michelle Reba and, and Joe Macy and others. Um, essentially, we showed that Practicing AWD does not reduce yield. It can um, even increase yield in many cases. And also, the irrigation energy efficient costs, AWD costs less money to implement. So these are big deals. Um, less diesel to run your pumps, as well as manage that water, move it around across paddies. So keeps yield up or increases yield, reduces costs. So now we're trying to figure out, okay, who's practicing AWD and what's the scale? Can we use the EO data to do that? Okay, so let me shift gears. I'll jump a little bit into the SAR uptake theme. So as part of harvest, as part of this rice MRV system, as part of the crop monitoring, there is a goal and interest in using radar to help produce the USDA NAS cropland data layer. I kind of call that the gold standard of crop type mapping. Crop type extent and timing is really the basic, most fundamental variable you need for food security. If you don't know where crops are, you can't really come up with a plan. So this was a kind of a pilot we did with USDA where we wanted to kind of test out Sentinel-1 for mapping crop types. We've got these kind of four major study sites just in this example, and these are kind of color-coded to CDL for those of you that uh, have that imprinted in your head, where we've got soy, corn, and Arkansas. We've got a good portion of rice. California, you've got a lot of crops, including specialty crops, pistachios, almonds, etc. So we went in and kind of built these data cubes, these stacks of Sentinel-1. 
of Landsat, of Sentinel-2, of HLS, of Combined, and Pelsar-2, all those different kind of combinations. And here's an example across those study areas, and these are using default cloud masks. These are kind of heat maps of the number of observations, so the kind of the four study regions, Arkansas, Ohio, South Dakota, California. And you can see there's places where you can get pretty good coverage from the optical data, and in the U.S. there's really not a lot of clouds throughout the entire growing season, like in monsoon Asia, or tropical Africa, et cetera. Whereas Sentinel-1, no cloud problems. This was kind of in the early spin-up of Sentinel-1, so we're typically dealing with frequency observations, and typically in the teens, although some places you can see get up to 20, 30, 35 observations. And we're not going to go through all the details, but here's just some kind of results of that. You can see, I think it's Arkansas, Ohio, California, and South Dakota. And you could see early in the growing season, as expected, accuracies are pretty low. And these are relative accuracies, so don't worry too much about the exact number because I didn't include water, forest, urban in these classifications. But the idea was for these different crop types, can we compare how well this machine learning, here we used a random forest approach to just monitor crop type. And the take home message is, you know, typically by mid growing season, you're coming up with okay accuracies, 80, 85%. I don't know if you could quite see it, but I have these kind of color coded by sensor, sensor combination. And generally speaking, the combination of HLS, which is the harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 with Sentinel-1 tend to perform best. So not rocket science, but we tried to show that here. Sentinel-1 by itself does not do as good as the optical data. In other places like Monsoon Asia, I would call it much more critical. And then Pelsar-2, which is the longer L-band frequency, um, did not perform very well in California, but it's also a very complicated landscape um, with things like pistachios, almonds, tomatoes, et cetera, uh, alpha, alpha. So the take home message here, combination of the optical and SAR tend to outperform. By middle of the growing season, we're coming up with pretty good accuracies. We've been scaling this up. I've done some test runs for kind of the whole uh, what I call the ag belt, and um, the training data is pretty transferable north, south, east, west, so that's pretty exciting. And I'm nudging USDA, NAS, and others to try to begin to uptake this. I need some help from headquarters to make that part of their mission. So why did I talk about CDL? Well, CDL is also one of the main inputs for some of our soil moisture monitoring. Um, here's a kind of a, a, a workflow chart. I was interested in using Sentinel-1 because it's available, it's operational, it exists, it's field scale. That really hasn't happened um, globally. And we're using kind of our custom software here. Essentially, we're running a, a water cloud model approach. I would call it a semi-physical uh, technique. It's uh, widely established and accepted. Here it's dual pole C-band, so there are certainly technical challenges with trying to use that for soil moisture. Anyone that does soil moisture can tell you C-band has limitations, but we wanted to give it a shot in a large area operational automated context. So we did quite a bit of trying to understand some scattering mechanisms, kind of really did a deep dive. We wanted to have good physical meaning behind the workflow, not just a black box or kind of a, a machine learning approach. We wanted to understand it. We wanted to make it simple, transparent, robust. So we did quite a bit with um, EIM and of course then pushed that through the water cloud model to understand polarizations and we're getting a manuscript off the desk now. We then did this across the Mid-South, it's about 60,000 kilometers. Um, the green dots represent the Soil Climate Action Network stations. These are USDA, basically weather, soil moisture stations um, that collect uh, at multiple soil depths. And then these yellow boxes are where we do some of our experimental sites where we have paired control treatments where we have all those uh, essentially tubes in the ground measuring soil moisture, water table depth, et cetera. And Ben Runkel, Michelle Reba, and a lot of other folks at Ducks Unlimited, USA Rice have been instrumental. We're also driving our calibrated water cloud model with basically HLS or the optical data. There's about four unknown parameters in the water cloud model that you have to solve for. Traditionally, people kind of just have NVVI as the, as the solution, but of course that has limitations, saturations. Um, they also make assumptions about the temporal dynamics of surface roughness, which becomes uh, very important for soil moisture retrieval, as some of you guys know. 
So we, we did want to push that. And then we're doing some more um, what I would call lower level ARL testing here with Pelsar 2. I set up uh, what I call a super site multi temporal quad pole L band where we're looking at different decompositions, um, Yamaguchi, Andropov, um, Tuzi, essentially to look at inundation status. So, can we map soil moisture with what accuracy, with what temporal frequency, with what resolution? Can we map inundation? Those are what we're going for here to begin to get at those AWD questions. And this is a work in progress. Um, my goal here is just to generate ideas again and kind of stimulate some conversation. Anybody that wants to work on some of these data, I'm happy to share the in situ data, the algorithms, the workflow. Um, we need multiple people to help solve these problems. So some quick results, and I'll, I'll try to keep moving ahead quickly here. I know everyone's busy. So the take home message is that Sentinel-1 does okay. It doesn't do great, it doesn't do bad. And here you can see it for corn, soybean, cotton, and rice. Um, this is a think in Tunica, Mississippi. Anyone wants to go to an interesting place, Tunica, um, one of the poorest counties in the US, but um, they have these casinos right on the river. You could stay there for $40 a night. It's very bizarre. You get free Chinese buffet dinner too. So these red dots are the Sentinel-1 soil moisture retrievals at this Tunica site. Here we have, according to CDL, a cotton field. And you can see it does okay. There's places where, you know, when it's up, we're up. When it's down, we're down. There's places where are we getting a little ahead of the curve or below the curve. Hard to say. With corn, we did not do too well. I think essentially the water cloud model for, in, in short, helps disregard some of that double bounce scattering. So when NDVI gets above seven, which is really a good portion of the growing season, right? It really begins to saturate and that double bounce just threw the model off. So uh, I'm working on some workarounds to try to solve that. And then some kind of, some pictures. So this A point is this shot right here. I can't quite read the date. It looks like uh, early May to kind of what, mid July, late July, kind of the change. But the point is here, it's, these are 10 meter resolution. So this is field scale. So we're starting to get towards being able to map these soil moisture attributes at field scale. I'll also argue or note or suggest that even when the model begins to saturate, I think there's still qualitative value in some of these indicators. Even if we know, oh, it's a little wetter than last time, a little drier than last time, that still has value, I think, to the overall system. And we're working on kind of quantifying that uncertainty or error propagation. So kind of a quick example. I did want to kind of test the transferability of that. So I picked up that modeling framework, that workflow, and kind of dropped it down in Thailand. <laughs> I used that constrained model. And here I'm kind of applying it across rice, sugarcane, rubber, durian. I don't know if anyone knows durian. It's known as kind of the stinkiest fruit in the world. I, I once tried to get on a flight from Chiang Rai, and they basically kicked me off because I was smuggling a bunch of durian on the plane. But anyway. Um, it does okay, however, um, I think it's a little misleading. Here's an example of SMAP over time and just basically gamma knot from Sentinel-1VV. I think essentially what we're really just capturing is the monsoons. We're just basically, when it rains there, the rains come, it basically rains three, four, five months straight, and then the rains go away. So I think these, well, these scatter plots show pretty robust, accurate Sentinel-1 soil moisture retrievals. I think we're really capturing largely the rainfall. So I don't want to give the impression that it's super robust or operational. I'm working on this. And then we're trying to figure out how can we downscale SMAP. I've talked to a few folks about that today. If there's anyone in here that works on this, please let me know. I know there's work getting it to nine kilometer, one kilometer. Can we get it down towards field scale? That's what I'm trying to work on. Um, so I was, I've got these ground truth sites across the Thai plateau with JISDA. Um, this project's trying to understand the impacts of dams on the Mek or the impacts of dams on the Mekong to kind of the region. And this is one of our study regions. So we've got some nice in situ data. Again, I'm happy to share it. Um, so can we use SMAP to maybe train the model or vice versa? And I'm still kind of flirting with this, but it seems like there's pretty good correspondence between that Sentinel-1 driven water cloud model and SMAP. These are all kind of independent validated, um, but obviously drastically different scales. Um, so we're working on trying to fuse those. And just to start to wrap up, um, 
NISAR is coming pretty soon. For those of you that know, that'll be L-band, S-band. Um, the ASF DAC is going to kind of be charged with leading um, the housing of that data. They're moving everything to the cloud, so pretty exciting. I've been working with JAXA for quite some time on the Kyoto and Carbon Initiative. So I tried to get a super site going in Arkansas, and I did that, um, where we had that multi-temporal quad pole L-band. And not surprising, the L-band is very successful at just mapping inundation. So where that Sentinel-1 tends to break down when NDVI begins to surpass 0.7, give or take, which is probably, what, late June, pretty early, really, in the crop season, um, my thought is I can then begin to under, under kind of under, underlie that whole framework with the L-band data. Um, and again, looking at some decompositions, and, I, and I'm happy to talk about this technically follow up or anything. Um, the soil moistures are very high relative to the ground truth, so I'm still kind of working on why that is. I think part of the problems, one of the main problems is whenever I had uh, a Pelsar 2 overpass for my rice paddies, they were always flooded. I never was able to capture a dry down event. So the temporal frequency becomes really important. Um, you could have a dry down seven or eight days long. If you kind of miss that window, then potentially you miss that farmer practicing AWD. So we have to find a solution to that. Can we use HLS? Can we downscale SMAP? Um, can we use some kind of modus gozar fused product? I, I don't really know yet. Um, and, and kind of a really cool, again, a, a, an early ARL, but testing it. We did some pole INSAR, this is kind of differential polar or, or, or quad pole interferometric work. This is essentially about a two month, one month gap where we're getting these repeats with the same viewing geometry. And this is pretty exciting because here we were able to, here's a, a, an unwrapped geocoded um, interferiogram versus some water table depth change metrics. Um, and we're kind of trying this out in different environments, some, uh, some, some peatlands up in Stordal in Sweden and some, some peat bogs in Indonesia. We're trying to kind of use these tools to measure water table depth. Um, and again, not perfect by any means, but coming up with pretty decent accuracies across those different types of biomes. And it's operational, it's physically driven, it's automated, it's robust, so that's pretty exciting too. Um, so we're hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll keep this going and hopefully NISAR keeps progressing and we're only about a, a couple of years away from launch. Uh, that'll really be a game changer for people that want to use radar. It's, it hasn't existed for a long time. NASA is now back in the radar game, so very exciting. Just a quick example of where we're kind of putting it all together. So here's from Red River Delta, part of the USAID Ag Results Program, and I've shown a couple of these slides before. But it's kind of neat where we have these pole mechanisms to promote climate smart ag. Uh, pole mechanism is where we basically give out awards, we give out prizes. So whoever comes up with the best technique, and there can be many, many types of practices to reduce their carbon footprint while not increasing yields, gets a million dollars. So we've had a few first rounds. We were in phase one, we're now in phase two. We've got about 10 different people across Taibin collecting data, including chambers, including soil moisture, water table depth, varieties, planting direction. And here's kind of an example. We've been mapping kind of the rice extent, the crop calendar, the AWD hydro period, where I've got that high temporal frequency over in that part of the world, cropping intensity, and we're using all that to drive the DNDC model. So here's basically a carbon equivalent of methane emissions at the commune level. Um, so pretty exciting. And again, the take home message here, the, the, it, the text didn't show up, but this is conventional flooding. This lower red dot is AWD. So here we're showing we have about half the order of magnitude, about half the footprint um, across the region. And we're now scaling this up nationwide to all of Vietnam. So pretty exciting. Uh, and it's fun to kind of give out these prizes. It generates a lot of buzz. It kind of creates new innovation, gets the market involved. So it's pretty fun. So what am I doing in 2019? And I invite everybody to join in any of this. The idea is to kind of keep growing this PPP, this public-private partnership across the Mid-South. I'm really trying to focus on mapping irrigation, mapping soil moisture. I've started to dabble in ET. I'm not an ET expert. Um, I'd like to kind of put that into the portfolio here. Um, we are doing this 
besides just rice, we've, this year we'll have treatment plots and soy um, where we're controlling all the irrigation, all the managements. We all have 90, 40 acre blocks that are all paired. We've also been doing quite a bit with what I call this low power wide area, kind of this internet of ag, internet of technology hub where we've got all these sensors spread out. We're trying to do these sensors for less than $100. The bottleneck isn't really the sensor, it's transmitting the data from the sensor to the database. So we're working on installing these hubs that kind of aggregate uh, kind of a network of these sensors, so it's pretty cool. For those of you that follow NISAR, I'm pretty excited, a little nervous. UAV star starts flying next week. Um, we're gonna do 12 day repeats out of Houston where we're gonna kind of have a morning AM loop and then a PM loop. Um, we've got about a dozen or so sites, including three in the lower Mississippi where we have all those field, set, field network sensors set up. And really that's part of the launch for NISAR, which is you know, hopefully two, three years away. I uh, just did see a new call for the ISRO ASAR campaign that's going to be fast tracked. So if anybody wants to get involved uh, with that call, please let me know. I'm happy to see what I can do. And really my goal at the end of this is, can I come up with wall to wall field scale soil moisture metrics? Um, you know, we've got some work to do with scaling the ARL, but I really feel like um, it's not that far away. I think it's feasible. And really that EO is going to be driving these MRV tools. And then what's the idea? My interests are supporting that sustainable rice platform. That's really what um, kind of my, my passion is in. So hopefully, I'll, I'll wrap up. Hopefully I kind of gave you three things to think about that the open access operational SAR and optical EO, that's really the key to scaling the next generation of decision support tools. Um, the MRV platforms, I really feel, I truly believe that that's gonna be the key to kind of linking industry, linking farmers linking kind of these NASA centers um, really for the next few decades. Um, I, I, I see things on Twitter about the Green New Deal and everything, but I don't think we're going to flip the switch um, anytime soon. So for the next few decades, we're going to have to get farmers, producers on board to help mitigate some of these impacts and kind of work together. Um, so really, I believe EO data, moderate resolution, is really going to be the key for the next few decades to getting towards the sustainable development goals to really achieving these grand challenges. Um, so those are kind of the three messages that I hope I, I told a story about. Hopefully I interested you a little bit. Anybody wants to talk about SAR tech transfer, let me know. I'm happy to do some workshops, host anybody at my shop in New Hampshire. Uh, I mentioned I'd like to look at kind of fusing some of these water balance metrics. I'm not an expert on all these things. Soil moisture, some of the ET models out there. I know there's a big land information system crew down here. I'd love to kind of link up. Um, Gozar is up there and running. I think there's a smart way to put all those together for better ag water management. And thanks to Beth, Jodong, Bill, Michelle, Jigo, and, and again, all the funders, many, many people, many projects have supported aspects of this work. So NASA, USDA, and industry partners. And with that, I'll stop. So thank you. Have you worked with EcoStress data at all? No, is my short answer. I've been going back and forth. I don't know if I'm saying something naughty here offline, unofficially with Martha Anderson on unfunded work, trying to explore dyslexia and eco-stress. Um, we're trying to find mechanisms to make that work happen. Um, so I've started to do that, um, yes. But I haven't gotten to the point where I would say we're now using it. Uh, and of course, the actual instrument, just only six months old or whatever, up there and running. And some of it failed, right? Do you have a sense of how salvageable the data are? I don't know. I've been working more with Gozar, trying to get some of their kind of thermal imagery sharpened with Veer's R5 channel to sort of help inform some of these thermal diurnal change questions. Um, but um, some of that expertise is not mine, okay. and I'm working on it. Thanks. Other questions? Thank you. <clears throat> I'm not a SAR expert, but when you mention soil moisture, what is the uh, penetration of the uh, SAR measurements? 
what does the SAR measure? I'm, I'm not sure I understood all that. What, what is the SAR measuring? Yes, which the, uh, the penetration depth. Oh, good question. Yeah, there's different rules of thumb. Essentially, I'm calling this five centimeter volumetric water content, or you could put it into whatever units you want. Um, the L-band data is about 23 and a half or so centimeter wavelength. So there you're getting much more canopy penetration as well as surface penetration. But it also matters on your substrate. Um, a big challenge is making assumptions about surface roughness. That's very time consuming to collect in the field. Typically, we just kind of put in a constant coefficient. Um, but a, I would also argue that surface roughness changes throughout a season. And if you're using C-band, you know, five centimeters, give or take, um, a slight change in roughness could have a big impact on your signal. Um, but generally, I would say we're measuring surface soil moisture, not root zone depth or those kinds of parameters, if I'm answering your question. Okay, so, so how do you use the soil moisture from SAR for the uh, process-based model if sure. you don't measure root zone? How do you link for irrigation or? Sorry. Oh, yeah. So I think the question is how are we using the soil moisture to help drive the process based modeling? So essentially, we're using it to drive, nudge, constrain our greenhouse gas and yield model. So we have the DNDC process based model, and I say the word ORISA, although we've rewritten ORISA and into an end enterprise level code, we put them together. So those run on daily time steps. They require parameterization. Soil moisture is one of the parameters that drives some of the micro processes within those models. Um, so we use the soil moisture as well as various Monte Carlo simulations, et cetera, to nudge, drive, correct that model where in situ data is not available. And it's mostly driven by the VV channel in this case. So you use soil moisture from SAR? Sorry, me? Do you use soil moisture from SAR? Yes. Yes? Yes. Do, are, the, are the people online hearing these microphones? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, um, I'm intrigued by your interest in using the water balance variables to constrain this. So I guess, you know, this DNDC model does it not already have water budget constraints? I guess I'm trying to figure out what's new, you know, because what, I don't know what's in that box, but a lot of what these other models have are just, you know, land surface models that solve water and energy balance equations. So what would that add to your ex system? Yeah, good question. Do I need to repeat that? Or yeah, what, what? Yeah, uh, how are we adding the to the work sorry say that again so i can repeat right, it so the, qu the question is you know if you if you have a water balance model like the models in lists which are just land surface models those all have water and energy balance simulations okay how would that add information to your current system because dndc must have inter water and energy balance in it already right right how does so. water balance add to the system so and to take one step back we have kind of two arrows to these key performance indicators we can do direct kind of field scale retrieval of those elements using satellite algorithms in a perfect world. We're not there yet, but that's what we're working on. And or in complement, we can sort of use those parameters to sharpen, tune, have spatially explicit metrics within the modeling framework. Three, we kind of come up with just what I call a statistical ensemble, you know, where we do all these different runs, all these different retrievals and come up with a probability distribution, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm focused not so much on driving the model with the satellite work, but more the direct retrieval to help assess ET, to help assess the irrigation managements, if that's answering your question. Um. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, so if you look at, like, well, I'm most familiar with LISP, but so, I mean, those, those systems have some overlap with what you're doing, right, because we actually have... Um, we run, we run ensembles and we can do data assimilation. We also can do uncertainty, you know, with Markov chain, Monte Carlo methods. So some of that may overlap with what you have, but I guess the big point might be that um, you could think of these physical models as a first guess. You know, that you could, you could get some kind of background continuous field, which is 
you know, maybe not representative at the field scale, but at least it gives you some constraint on those state variables that you're trying to estimate. And maybe that's how you could use it. Is that, yeah, is yeah, that, that was a, a good point. And I think I saw a, a tweet a few weeks ago about CONUS scale, one kilometer Liz runs maybe, so kudos right. for that. Right. And I think you also said the keyword field scale. Really, you have to get down to management scale to make a decision yeah. um, to you know, move the needle on, on, on dollars, on livelihoods. Um, so right, is there some way where we could sort of put those together um, or come up with the baseline? I, I'd have to you know, spend some time thinking about it. Right. Um, but can we use that satellite retrieval to sharpen the field scale um, is kind of what I'm trying to figure out. Um, but I don't, I don't have a perfect answer. Yeah, it's not unlike what Dysalexi, sorry. <laughs> it's not unlike what Dysalexi does relative to Alexi, right? So Alexi is the large scale estimate of fluxes and Dysalexi uses the Landsat to disaggregate that to that scale. Yeah, and that's where, given the temporal repeat of Landsat, can we sort of sharpen down Gozar or something or the Veers channel? Uh, again, I'm just sort of exploring that. Um, but those are things that I think could really help. Okay, we've got a question uh, online. So uh, Sunita asked, how are you sampling in situ fields for CalVal? Is it a percentage of fields? Uh, good question. Different um, is my answer. In places like Arkansas, you have to go where you're allowed to go or where you can go, where we have partners. We work with local partners, farmers. We work with universities, University of Arkansas. We work with the Agricultural Research Service in Jonesboro. We work with industry, companies like Rice Tech. Um, there's organizations like Ducks Unlimited. Um, so we kind of do our best to have a smart stratified sample. Through programs like ARS, we have um, good control, thanks to people like Mike Sullivan, that let us go out there and manipulate his fields or control them. But of course, pumps break and, and uh, field managers sometimes do what they want to do. Um, but we do our best. Um, for example, this year, we've got right now planned 16 40-acre paired treatments for corn and soy, or no, for rice and soy outside Osceola where for each one we'll implement either AWD or MIRI. We know the varieties, we know the fertilization rates. Um, so a lot of these farmers get on board and we were talking a little bit earlier about how do you sort of work with them because um, they're often the guinea pigs and I kind of gave the joke where they, they feel like second mouse gets the cheese. Um, so w we work with the producers to help to allow for them to allow us to manipulate their fields. Um, and then networks such as SCAN, and some of these other sensors that are out there, we do our best to leverage those as well. Um, yeah, and I can give more specific details over email or something if anyone wanted to follow up. Sure. Any other questions? Yes. So in your uh, retrieval algorithm, I saw IE model there. So IE model is very sensitive to the surface roughness. I wonder how do you get your surface roughness for the retrieval? And second of all, um, the SAR image is, I mean, one of the big issue of the SAR image is the speckle noise. And especially if you have a very uh, fine spatial resolution, the speckle noise is very uh, severe. So how do you deal with it? And what is your uh, retrieval errors? Yeah, good, good question, and I could follow up with you and share you a technical manuscript we've got drafted. RMSE is in the neighborhood of five to eight, which is a bigger number than we want it, because in some places, a cotton field with a, 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 a low soil, that's the difference between wilted and thriving. Um, I gotta be politically correct here. Sentinel-1 is gonna have challenges for mapping, retrieving soil moisture. I think we know that, it's dual pole at C-band. I do think it has value, even during the crop season when NDVI is over seven, over seven give or take, but that's definitely when it breaks down totally. Um, we do some field measurements for soil roughness and texture, um, but as I mentioned, we make assumptions about the consistency of that over space, or more importantly, the dynamics of that 
throughout a year. Chances are it changes, and we assume that it doesn't. So we work on trying to quantify that air propagation. I don't have a, a magic wand um, to do that, um, but we are working on that. Basically, you put out these big kind of uh, frames where they have all these pins that drop down. You put the pin down, and then you kind of count um, how far up the pins go over a rough meter by meter plot, or there's different ways to do it. Um, we've been trying to come up with some kind of cool, almost like Google Glasses, where you kind of kind of just look and you can get readings of texture. I haven't seen that work yet, to be honest. Um, but yeah, the, the soils data is really important in all this work. And in some places, that data is very good. In other places, it's non-existent. So we have to make assumptions, and I'm happy to follow up with more um, technical information, if that's helpful. But if you have any solutions, please let me know. If there are no further questions, let's thank Nate for his seminar, and thanks all for coming. Great. Thanks. Thank